So Ian, can you help me remind the people in the group? So welcome guys uh, to today's event where we are going to be introduced to Sino, which is uh, an open internal developer platform framework, uh, which we look forward to be taken through today. So on our agenda, uh, on our agenda, or before our agenda, we have a quote. And the quote uh, for today is, fail fast, last long. So what does this mean? If you fail fast, you are able to make improvements and you are able, you are able to create more quality. So you can be able to uh, last long because you can be dependable, you can be more stable because you failed fast and you improved. So you got better fast. So that is what it means. So when you are doing anything, uh, it's better for you to have the perspective of uh, it's okay for you to fail. So, and when you fail, the more frequent you fail, the more you learn. If you have a problem, uh, a solution oriented mindset as well, you can be able to learn fast and you get better. But if you fail and give up, you'll not be able to, to last long. So you have to fail and learn from it and continue risking, continue learning, continue pushing yourself. And as you do that, every failure you encounter, you take it as an opportunity to learn and you'll be able to last long or to be more valuable. So that is what that means. Uh, on our agenda, uh, we are going to start by introducing you to the community. I will tell you about what the community is about. And uh, after that, uh, I'm going to hear from Carlos Santana. And then after the session, we'll be having our Q&A session. So the first thing that you're going to do is the icebreaker. So for our icebreaker, I would like you to respond on the chat. So you can uh, give your responses on the chat. And if you wish to speak, you can raise your hand. So the question is, would you rather travel around the world in a spaceship for 100 years, then die after those 100 years, or live on Earth forever? So keep your answers coming on the chat box. And in case you want to speak, you can just raise your hand and we'll give you the opportunity to do that. So is there anyone uh, who I would like to comment on that? Comment on the chat. I'm looking at the chat, waiting for your responses. So would you rather travel around the world in a spaceship for 100 years, then die or live forever on Earth? Which one would you rather do? Uh, uh, waiting for your responses, looking at the chat. I hope you're typing. Is there anyone who'd like to speak? You can just raise your hand and I'll give you the opportunity to speak. Anyone who would like to talk? Is there anyone, uh, guys, inside the meeting, or am I alone? <laughs> so I can see here, Alvin says, depends if I am given the same 100 years on Earth. So on Earth, you are living forever. So if you, uh, between living forever, being immortal on Earth, or having only 100 years, and those 100 years, you are allowed to go around the world in a spaceship, which one would you prefer? So Anita, you're saying live on Earth, 
uh, you'd prefer only 100 years or oh, to live forever on earth okay so is there anyone else is there anyone else uh maybe we can hear from anita why do you think uh you should uh you why would you prefer to live on earth hello anita are you able to speak are you able is there anyone else or oh, my mic is deactivated is uh try now is it still deactivated if you try now okay now i can okay yeah so the reason why i choose to live on earth um it's because uh while you get to travel around the universe you are confined inside your spaceship so you can't really even touch anything that you see uh in the other universes that you travel but if you are on earth you get to live real experiences meet other people outside <laughs> make new connections uh and more physical connections yeah so i'll get to experience more while i'm on earth than on space confined in a spaceship okay that is good uh is there any other person would like to comment on that one last person you can get one uh, one more person one more comment one more person one more comment uh for me i think i would prefer to go around the world because i think on earth i've already seen everything that uh that i wanted to see so and what i normally believe like um you will want too much of something may be boring so if you live on earth forever going through the same things again and again you go through covid you go through things that um are not good uh you experience all technology until you're tired so every nothing will be interesting anymore so i prefer to have just the adventure to see the entire universe i think that will be a better thing for me so about the community so we are nairobi devops community so the event that we are attending today has been organized by nairobi devops community and uh nairobi devops community is basically a community of devops enthusiasts so we have uh, people who are new to devops and we also have experts in our community and what we do is host several events that are geared towards ensuring that people can be able to learn from each other and also network so uh, uh, we have uh, several types of events that we do so we have online events uh, such as this one that we are having today we have campus tours uh, where we have uh, events that we go to universities around Kenya and we also have uh, summits so we have uh, Africa DevOps Summit which we did last year it was called Nairobi DevOps Summit but we changed the name so that we can be able to take it to different uh, cities and we also have DevOps Days uh, which is a global event that happens in various cities in the world and it's going to happen in Nairobi here for the first time and uh we are part of the organizers for that event so uh those are the major things that we do we also have fun activities that we do so we do outdoor activities we do uh maybe visits to data centers and we're also planning uh, hiking and more opportunities for people to and tours that can help people uh, meet and network so our mission is to create a supportive and inclusive community that supports diversity and uh, sub, uh, and that values diversity and supports learning and growth and our vision is just to be a leading devops community in nairobi and beyond driving innovation and empowering professionals to excel in their careers uh in case you want to participate in the community and help us in organizing the events uh, what you can do is uh, one of the ways you can help us is by maybe running workshops if you are an expert or talks you can also uh, 
help us find speakers so you can connect us with people who you think can add value to our sessions you can also give us feedback on what we are doing and help us uh, see how we can improve on what we do you can also share our posts on our uh, online platforms and uh, so that we can be able to reach out to more people you can also share on our, on our channels and on our platforms so that people can learn from you about anything uh, about your knowledge or anything you're learning uh, any problem you have solved you can share such things and people will benefit from that you can also share materials that can help people or opportunities uh, internships work uh, or job openings so all those things will be beneficial to the community uh, you can also help us in organizing our events so if you think you can help us uh, you are gifted in event organizing you can uh, join us and help us in doing that and also in branding so if you are a person who is gifted in graphic design or any of uh, uh, creative uh, uh, any of the creative skills if you have any creative skill you can join us and help us in any of the of any of those so in case you are not part of our community uh, you can scan and link, join our LinkedIn group. Uh, on our LinkedIn group, you can be able to to post anything. You can be able to see what people are posting. We have WhatsApp groups. Uh, I think uh, this has not been updated, so the, this WhatsApp is full. So we are working. We have an, an overflow group. I think we'll we'll be able to replace that here. So we just forgot to put, to update it. So you, Twitter, you can follow us on Twitter as well. But you can, meanwhile, you can just ensure you, uh, you are on our LinkedIn and Twitter. And uh, that, there you'll be able to see what we are doing. And on LinkedIn, you can be able to post anything as well. So uh, in case you have any question about the community, you can ask as we. Uh, so I, uh, let me see if uh, Carlos uh, is here. Just a second. So I can see Carlos is here with us. So Carlos is going to uh, be leading us today. And uh, we'll just give him, uh, he'll, he'll just be sharing ab uh, about uh, the topic today in a few. I'm here. So, oh, good, good, good. So Carlos, I've given you uh, co-host permission. So you'll be hearing people trying to join the meeting. So you can just ignore when you hear the beep. So I'll be I'll be the one admitting them to the meeting. Okay. okay. Looks like we have a we have quorum. We have full folks. Yeah, yeah. So I think I'll stop uh, presenting if there is no question for the community, uh, and then I'll let Carlos take over from here. So you can just share your screen, and then you proceed from there. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, very uh, grateful to join your DevOps community. Um, I think it's late over there, right? Uh, here in the in the US, I'm on the East Coast, it's 1 p.m. So, yeah, it's so, uh, 8 p.m. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so you are all hardcore uh, DevOps engineers. Uh, you're learning this, um, want to learn more about this space um, DevOps uh, platform and cloud. So I have a couple of slides, uh, but um, I'll be doing a couple of demos uh, to show you kind of like hands on on how you can get started uh, on some of these aspects. Um, if you're learning DevOps, the best way to learn it is um, hands on and, and practicing in your uh, in the computer, right? Um, and doing this type, this type of exercises. And, and learning hands-on, that's the best way to uh, to get prepared for uh, either you're looking for the job market or you're already in the job market. So there's never um, never stopping of, of learning something new. So I'll give a, um, a high-level overview about platform engineering and then a project uh, about Canoe. Uh, before that, let me uh, share some slides. I'll do an intro. Just can find a thing to, to share. One second. So I'll share these slides here. I think it's a window. Everybody see my window? 
Yes, we can. Okay. Um, and just uh, in the chat, um, have um, yeah, put in the chat. I'll be reading the chat also. Um, if you want to answer there also, uh, who's here uh, is a, a platform engineer um, or a DevOps engineer? You can put it in the chat to see if uh, we have fo some folks um, that are in that role. And also put in there if you are like uh, looking into into getting to this space and learning what it is, uh, maybe trying to get a job in this space. Um, so with that said, uh, my name is Carlos Santana. I'm a, um, a senior solutions architect uh, specialist on EKS. Um, this is Kubernetes on AWS Cloud. Um, I, I work for AWS uh, for the last two years, and my role is around helping customers around the world, uh, large companies on building uh, platforms on top of Kubernetes um, and helping them to manage their Kubernetes fleet and also build a developer platform um, on top of it, um, particularly on, on EKS, uh, which is our cloud offering for Kubernetes. Um, I'm also part of the open source community I'm a CNCF ambassador for the CNCF uh, for the last year uh, where I do community work. Uh, for example, I run the CNCF Kubernetes book club um, for the last three years. That's a book club that we meet twice uh, a week on Thursdays and Fridays. Every is virtual. Everybody's uh, welcome to join. Uh, you can find us if you Google CNCF Kubernetes book club on, on LinkedIn or the CNCF communities, you'll be able to find us uh, there. And we just discuss, it's a learning platform for people that want to learn about Kubernetes um, uh, through books. And also I'm part, I've been doing open source for many years. Uh, lately, I was the uh, co-founder of a project called Knative. I also did release engineering release team for upstream Kubernetes. And lately, I'm being uh, involved as a member of the Argo CD uh, community, the Argo Argo project, uh, which includes Argo CD, Argo rollouts, Argo events, uh, Argo workflows. So with that intro, uh, let's start uh, talking about platform engineering. Um, let me see, my slides are, are coming. Uh, um, is the slides are moving for folks? OK, I see thumbs up. Good. Um, so the, the the idea with platform engineering is um, going to talk a little bit about autonomy versus standardization. And this picture kind of shows of the platform engineering thing, kind of like uh, looking for standardization on all the, uh, all the uh, DevOps platform in the organization and also showing the developer they are trying to get uh, across the bridge uh, with autonomy, uh, getting to their goal with autonomy of like having uh, the power to control the things that they want to control, but there needs to be a balance there um, for that. So let's start talking about if you are in the in a platform engineering role um, and or you are a leader uh, on a platform engineering, you have different teams trying to build workflows and applications. Um, those applications will have different requirements. Um, some of them are uh, for machine learning. AI, other ones could be for web processing, other ones could be for batch operations, like finance uh, type of workloads. Um, and those workloads would need infrastructure. And the idea with platform engineering is the team that is in charge of having that cloud resources distributed between the applications that they need them. So things like, do we choose something like compute, for example, Amazon EKS, or maybe they have Amazon EC2. Uh, so today we're going to talk about um, Amazon EKS. Uh, infrastructure, um, ma infrastructure management spectrum, like if you're working with the cloud and you're in charge of like managing those cloud resources for your organization, the idea is like not everyone needs to be an expert in the cloud that you're working with. Um, you can have a couple of people working on that, but the idea is do you do you go decentralized? Do you give access to everyone, to every application team to deploy and maintain their own infrastructure? Um, and, or you go centralized, like you are centralizing any access to infrastructure on behalf um, of the application team. So it's a spectrum. There's no uh, right or wrong. It's deciding like what uh, best model works for your for your organization. 
So this is a, a simple example of cars, like everybody knows uh, about cars. So there's a certain number of individuals in the organization um, that knows the in and out. So you can give it like a, a piece, uh, parts of an engine, and they're experts with those parts of uh, putting those parts together and building an engine. And, and there are certain uh, skills needed for that. Um, Right, that they're they're people that work with engines can put them together. They can fix them. Uh, they can change the parts and customize the parts. But the majority of the people um, in the org, or in, like this is an abstraction, just need a car. Uh, they would just need to get from point A to point B. So they want a car with an engine, but they don't have to know about the parts of the engine or, or putting an engine together. They just want to be. Uh, efficient with their time to get them from point A to point B. So that's the same aspect that we have in platform engineering. We have certain in individuals that will be focusing on putting these parts together to build the vehicle, but there's other individuals that just want a solution to get uh, from point A to point B or achieve a goal. So that's kind of like the balance that you have to have in an organization that not everyone will be like a builder of an engine like most of the people most of the organization will be wanting a car uh, to get from point a and point b and that's kind of the metaphor that that we use when we talk to organizations so customer some customer examples that i have worked with um, building platform uh, engineers uh, engineering in case of aws is the new york times a very popular uh, uh, news news organization that they run Amazon EKS, or you said Kubernetes, and they have a platform engineering team and a platform that they develop themselves where they have, in this case, multi-tenancy, where the, a team will ask for an environment and they will be given a namespace in a, in a Kubernetes cluster. And they also customize it to the point that they have a platform CLI, uh, command line utility, um, command line interface that the in developers will use to access that that um, infrastructure that is given to them access to the platform, and they have been successfully building a platform on top of Kubernetes and managing uh, a self-serving of those Kubernetes clusters through uh, a portal where they request uh, some resources and then they get access to it. Um, so that's for developers. Another example that I have worked with is NASA. I worked with NASA uh, last year and we still continue working. So they're building a platform on top of a hybrid platform where they have some resources, compute resources on premise and some resources on cloud. And they wanted to build, they wanted to build and they built a, uh, a platform for scientists. In this case, they're not, not developers, but these are people that are scientists that are doing uh, science, uh, for example, weather, uh, weather, weather models where they are like building these models, they're testing these models, and they're also like benchmarking these models. And, and they want to provide a quick way to provide a Jupyter, Jupyter notebook as a service. So, um, for example, they had a, uh, last, last year in the summer, they have a, a large number of interns, um, from, from college coming into to NASA to work for the summer, and they wanted to have them up and running the first day that they come in, where they can go to a web browser and request a Juniper notebook, and then start collaborating with data that is hosted, for example, in, in S3, that is publicly available uh, as part of the um, a joint project between AWS and NASA, where we give resources to NASA to host that uh, scientific, scientific info data on, on S3, but as a click of a button, they can click a button, get a Jupyter, Jupyter uh, notebook to do science. Uh, and these are scientists, but behind the scenes, the platform team that I work with, they're provisioning uh, automatically the other infrastructure that powers that Jupyter as a service. Things like a Kubernetes uh, cluster, uh, namespaces, the software that runs in it, and uh, the storage, like uh, a CSI driver and EFS and the S3 buckets and everything, all that's driven through GitOps uh, in terms of uh, the platform. So they can get a platform up and running in a few minutes and have different versions in different regions, for example. So NASA is working on that. And that's a good example of platform engineering providing an abstraction that not everyone 
those scientists don't have to be experts in cloud resources. They don't have to know what Kubernetes is or what how many worker nodes it has. What they want is a Jupyter notebook where they can click a button, get a Jupyter notebook where they can do science with Python and a, and a terminal to run those uh, experiments uh, using something like HPC, which also it gets configured automatically with the platform. So those are two examples uh, so people can see like, where's platform engineering uh, can help an organization to accelerate how they deploy applications and how they accelerate their, their people they could be developers or they could be scientists uh, to be able to provision a new environment to do work uh, without worrying about like the details behind the scenes uh, where these resources are being requested. Um, let me see what we have behind. Um, so that's the benefits of, uh, I think I mentioned already that the internal, the, the benefits of an internal platform, having the velocity to get applications up and running very fast. They have the governance where uh, they have security uh, concerns that they're taking care of. So the cloud team uh, can make sure that what, when that environment, that namespace gets created, it has the right network policies and security groups associated with it, and also scanning of the images. So the, the team, the platform team is in charge of that, meaning like the DevOps, also the DevOps uh, engineers and the cloud engineers working on that with the security team. And the last one is efficiencies on maximizing the use, uh, the utilization of those resources. For example, things like uh, in Kubernetes would be Carpenter, which is a auto scaler that dynamically provisions uh, worker nodes based on the workload resources. So it, it maximizes the usage of those uh, nodes, uh, eliminating waste. So that way the organization like saves, saves uh, money in terms of running their uh, work those as efficient as possible um, in the cloud or on-premise. And then we move to standards. So standards is uh, a way of like the builders uh, want to have uh, a standards, um, the platform builders want to have standards that every team does things consistently. And maybe they're using the same uh, kind of technology. So for example, if they are choosing like Kiverno as their uh, policy management and um, to declare policies in Kubernetes. They want everyone to use that as a standard and have the set of policies applied to every team on every workload. Uh, but at the same time, the autonomy of the developers, they want to have, and data scientists, they want to have like a quick way to get to their environments up and running and also be able to log in and may, maybe get in the, the logs uh, available without asking another person to, uh, give them access to dashboards or the logs or to debug something in a different in a in a in an environment so they want the autonomy to make progress without the need of like asking or waiting for the platform team to provide that uh, so that's the balance of like the autonomy versus standards the, the developers and the platform teams always working together to see how can they come together into building a, a platform that works for both and that's the, the the dilemma of like, do you have more standards lowering the autonomy or do you have more autonomy lowering the standards? And the idea is to get to it to the, to the point that you can have a good balance between, between both. Challenges um, with this are, are, some of them are the level abstraction. Uh, sometimes you need to provide an abstraction that uh, give them a, a escape hatch. Uh, so there might be 5% of the workloads that uh, may not be able to use the platform that the platform team develops, the DevOps team develop. So it's okay to give them access directly to provision something or configure a piece of software directly. That way there's a escape hatch to do that. And that's okay. And that will give you time for the platform team to eventually uh, work in a solution that can provide that, or it's, it maybe is a ad hoc scenario. The other one is adoption. Adoption is a challenge because some teams may create the best platform and most efficient platform, but they forget about like how the developers or the scientists would adopt it. So in that, in this case, um, if you build it, they might not come. Um, so the idea is focus on documentation and having access, uh, good documentation and a good, um, uh, in, um, have the consumers of your platform created as a product involved from the beginning. So involving the consumers, in this case, the people that are going to use your platform, 
uh, like developers or scientists involved of the creation of that abstraction, that API that you're providing, and also a lot of documentation and to the point that some organization hosts um, office hours. Uh, so having office hours uh, to answer questions about how to best efficiently use the platform is a, a great way to get adoption. Um, and then I mentioned troubleshooting things like give them access to the developers. How they can, how can they get to the logs? How can they see metrics? How many, uh, where they can see the errors happening so they can be able to troubleshoot and get the information they need to fix a problem, maybe in dev or staging and sometimes in production. Uh, these are some of, uh, examples of isolation. Um, meaning that the platform team will want to have different ways of providing the platform. So it depends on how much isolation do you want to have uh, for these workloads. Uh, some workloads may require like a uh, region. Uh, so you may have a cluster in one region and a cluster in a different region. So they're isolated. Uh, or you can have something like namespaces. You can have a cluster with namespaces where you have a tenant uh, in one namespace working with their applications. And you have another tenant, meaning another application team or developer in a different namespace. So it's different levels of isolations that you can have uh, to the point that also taking care of network segmentation where uh, for regulation purposes, there's data that cannot be, um, you know, uh, needs to be separated from another workload. And also clusters, uh, meaning that um, you may not, you may have isolation in terms of like a team gets a full cluster and another team gets a full cluster and they're dedicated clusters for each team. So it depends what type of isolation uh, is required in the organization and then giving that, that pl the platform team to provide that API to that organization. Uh, and these are some of the design patterns, which I talked a little bit of uh, before was like um, the different isolation patterns that you can have in the cloud or uh, on premises, but this this case is more of a people building a platforms on top of cloud providers. So you can have like isolation of like accounts as a service that each team or different organization gets a different AWS account. Uh, for example, in AWS, uh, to the point that you can have a cluster as a service, like I mentioned, each team gets a cluster um, assigned, and that's the cluster that they deploy their workloads. So it could be like. Uh, there might be a team doing a um, machine learning or generative AI uh, that wants to have a full cluster and they get a cluster and maybe another team is doing like web, web services, transactions or web APIs and get they get a different cluster uh, assigned to them for their uh, workloads. And so you can do that also. Uh, this is an example of building uh, platforms in with Kubernetes, uh, with Kubernetes APIs. Um, in this case, I'm showing the a typical example that we work with some customers um, building platforms, which is uh, they want to use Kubernetes as the API to provision not just the containers, but also the AWS resources, meaning that Kubernetes APIs will be able to reconcile and make sure that the desired resources that the application needs are provisioned. So one example could be an application will need a database, uh, for example, Postgres uh, database in, in RDS. So the application needs that database, the application will be running in Kubernetes. So in, in, in Kubernetes, you can have tools like Crossplane or ACK, for example, uh, that you can have those YAML files uh, configure through Git, uh, surf in Git, and then something like Argo, which is shown here, number two. Argo CD is a GitOps engine that would reconcile those YAML files uh, from Git into Kubernetes controllers that uh, they will uh, provision uh, through the AWS API, the database, for example. Um, and also to the point that I was mentioning um, cluster as a service, if there's a team that needs a cluster, they can also have those YAML files in Git and then use Argo CD or, or Flux, a GitOps engine, to reconcile that into inside the Kubernetes cluster, which is a management cluster. And those uh, resources will be provisioned uh, in the cloud, in this case, uh, another EKS cluster. And I uh, show here OPA, but also Kubernetes, uh, the policy engine that 
since you have all these aspects configured inside Kubernetes, the application and also the resources that depend on, like an RDS or an S3 bucket or SQSQ, then you can have policies involved uh, in, in terms of Kubernetes, like something like Gatekeeper or Kiverno, where you specify uh, policy or rules that you want to follow. So for example, there might be a, um, a team or a developer that is uh, creating an application and in a namespace, it will create an app, a YAML file requesting an RDS, but that namespace is for dev. So maybe the size of the, of the RDS instance is, is small um, and then, or we less replicas, but there might be a different namespace for production that the same configuration is there, but it's slightly different in terms of scaling that will have more replicas and the instances will be bigger, meaning more CPU and memory. And that way, those policies uh, can be uh, followed using something like Gatekeeper and Kiverno. So that's an example of um, building, a, building a platform with Kubernetes APIs. And I would show uh, number seven is a B where the developers uh, will have a way of requesting this through a developer portal. And one implementation of the developer portal is Backstage. Uh, and Backstage is a CNCF project that you can have a, um, it's a, it's a web app, a UI that you can have multiple things in there like the te technical documentation, the catalog of things that have been already deployed uh, or, um, and then to the point that they can have uh, templates to create and request these new resources that eventually will create the GitHub repos, they will template the YAML files. And I will show a demo on that. Let's see what health. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what we are doing in this space. And um, in this case, uh, I'm representing here Linux. It's a distribution of a operating system uh, made from a software collection that is based on a Linux kernel. So the Linux kernel is something that is not going to change. Um, it has certain APIs and it's used everywhere. So that everybody knows how to do that. And then Linux is distribution of those packages and a package system. So what we're doing with a project called Canoe, uh, we want to build an IDP distribution. In this case, IDP stands for uh, Internal Developer Platform. Um, making a distribution of a developer platform, similar way of a software collection based on, in this case, instead of a Linux kernel will be based on Kubernetes and then as a package management system. So the same similar way as Linux is becoming like the central, the central of uh, these man uh, systems, uh, Kubernetes can be the, cent the center of an IDP. And with that, uh, there's a project called Canoe that uh, we started with the community. Uh, it's an internal developer platform distribution built in um, in the open with collaboration with the user community, uh, powered by CNCF technologies. And I think I, I, I already mentioned a few of them, like Backstage and Argo CD, um, Crossplane, and also things outside. Well, this, the CNCF called OpenTOFU or, or Terraform are also another ones that we have there. So the idea is that these companies, uh, user companies are coming together to create a IDP distribution that you can have different packages or stacks based on your needs. So you accelerate the way you build internal developer platforms rather than uh, spending a lot of time choosing a technology so these companies are large enough that are testing internally and providing those uh, learnings back to the community on how to best use um, the, the technologies together to build an IDP and also test an IDP for platform engineering engineers. So this is a uh, one of the one of the packages is the developer portal um, for best practices. Um, this is a blog post that we have in the website, the canoe.io. It talks about using developer portals uh, with uh, data quality. And you can see some of the authors here from different companies like um, Autodesk, Imagine Learnings, Twilio. 
and so and more companies. Uh, but in this case, these are some of the companies that uh, are working uh, blog work on this blog post, talking about how to use backstage. What are the backstage plugins and then new plugins that we're developing uh, to build an IDP on top of Kubernetes APIs. The next one is Argo CD. Argo CD is a main component. Um, it's, it's a GitOps engine. Uh, the Canoe project also has Flux listed as another good GitOps project. So the GitOps bridge is uh, a pattern that is used in terms of um, uh, creating clusters with add-ons where you bridge the infrastructure as code, things like Terraform, uh, Capi, Crossplane, Pulumi, that you cr create clusters with those technologies and then bootstrap everything with Argo CD using application sets. So it's a pattern of using application sets to extract that metadata to deploy the add-ons on this cluster. So it's uh, Argo CD is a main component of, of Canoe. So Backstage and Canoe are uh, two projects. The next one is um, IDP Builder. IDP Builder is a CLI, a command line uh, interface, very, very small C, uh, CLI that is for platform engineers. So uh, for the most time, always developers have a need for a quick dev cycle where they change their Python code or Go code or Java code. And they want an IDE uh, where they can like make a change, run a quick test, um, and then submit a pull request. Um, so this uh, IDP builder is the same thing, but for platform engineers that are building a platform with these stacks on top of Kubernetes. So IDP Builder will create you a Kubernetes cluster using Kind. Uh, so this is a very small distribution of Kubernetes or using um, um, yeah, using Kind, which is you can create it with Docker or Finch. Uh, we are adding support for Finch. But the idea is create a very small Kubernetes cluster that can be bootstrapped with Argo CD and then the stack on top of it also with Argo CD, things like uh, putting things together like a reference implementation that we have. One of them is Backstage, Argo CD, Argo Workflows, Keycloak, External Secrets, and Crossplane. So if you were going to put this together, um, maybe in a real cluster or a large cluster would take a lot of time. IDP Builder would do it like in five minutes. Um, you run it, you run the CLI against a folder, which you are sharing in your organization. And then quickly you can stand up the stack that you as a platform develop, platform engineer can make changes, test things, try things, add more packages, and quickly like delete and recreate. Or uh, in this case, you can submit a pull request and then the IDP Builder can be used in CI CD pipelines. Um, so this tool was, originally created by the company Autodesk uh, to do CI CD. And they're using it in CI CD in terms of using it in a, a very quick way to validate that their stack is correct and can come up. And also for their engineers that are developing backstage plugins, a quick way that they can have access to backstage, be able to quickly test their plugin development. So they're creating new plugins, developing new plugins and coding them. So they have a quick way for a person that probably may not know the internals of Kubernetes and they just need to write um, TypeScript uh, in, in Backstage to do that. And I'll, I'll have a demo on, on that. Um, I think that's it. I'll stop there and then I'll, I'll show a demo of Canoe. Um, we'll take questions if there's questions in the in the chat now. Any questions or comments? Uh, so far, there are no questions on the chat. So maybe people can just type on the chat if you have a question. Uh, keep on, you can type on the chat. Maybe you can just continue and then the moment the, oh, there is a question. So, Alvin is asking, is this a BYOL or? I don't bring your own. I don't know what BYOL means. Does it mean bring your own laptop? 
Okay, so there is another question here. How can I access this platform for practice purposes? Uh, which platform are you specifying? Oh, the uh, Canoe platform, maybe. I'll, okay, I'll show okay. that. I'll show that in a minute on how easy it is to get to get started um, and do lower the barrier of like entry. Um, so I'll, that's why I want to show the IDP builder. Um, or bring your own license. Um, in bring your own license. Uh, the the components. Uh, of Canoe are open source. So uh, all of them, I believe, are MIT or Apache 2. So there's no there's no license or fees to run the stack. Bring your own license like a controller. I'm not sure what that means. So maybe I can uh, allow Alvin to unmute and ask the question. So. Alvin, you can unmute and ask the question. Hi. <clears throat> so Hi. I'm I'm curious to know if uh, it's some sort of bring your own license. The way Aviatrix have created uh, a software, then they give it to you uh, per subscription, or is it? Uh, do I get an IP? An IP address. Yes, for accessing the uh, the IP build, IDP builder. Um, I'll, I'll show what IDP builder is. It's a it's a CLI, so there's no license needed uh, or anything. And then okay. you will be able to access the IP address uh, from your computer or from a local um, or from a uh, external um, uh, machine that you're running IDP builder on top okay. of it. Okay. Yeah, all these all these technologies are 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 open source. So the idea is like you can use uh, standards. Like we're basing this uh, a lot of the uh, standards like GitOps, uh, standards like Kubernetes APIs. Uh, that's become the the standard of the of the API. So the idea is to run your internal developer platform on top of Kubernetes. So you as a DevOps engineer, platform engineer, can benefit from the Kubernetes ecosystem. So anything out there that it runs in Kubernetes, uh, tooling for Kubernetes, um, you can use it in your internal developer platform to provide that DevOps experience for for your organization. Um, so it's it's more than the just Kubernetes being used for running the workloads or the con or the containers. It's used as a uh, management uh, control plane, uh, for example. So with that, um, before we run out of time, let me show you a few examples on how you quickly can get can get started. Uh, let me stop sharing here, and I will share. Uh, maybe I'll share my uh, desktop. Let me move things around, and you tell me if you can see what we have here. Let me share my window, entire screen. You tell me if you can see this. Yes, we can see. Yeah. So the um, starting point is Canoe. If you go to canoe.io, uh, this is the main, the main website like showing here. Um, and these are the components of the platform of like the capabilities that you will have in your internal uh, developer platform. And then these are some of the members that are in the in the project. The project is open source and you can find us in the CNCF Slack under canoe-interest. Um, and we have a technology radar of like choosing like which technologies do you want to use for your stack. So in this case, you see things like um, uh, a technology uh technologies that you can choose from make this a little bit bigger um that these companies are putting together of like which which things to use for for certain things on adopt trial access uh they think the technology capabilities um are here in terms of like 
if you're building an IDP, what are the things that you need to consider? Like, how do you do secret management? How do you do service discovery? How do you put code repositories? How do you do a developer portal, which we were talking about? And then we have the reference implementation in here where uh, we're going to be seeing today. And then like the reference implementation is like for each capability is like um, from infrastructure as code, right? You can have cross plane or Terraform. For a developer portal, you can have like backstage or identity and access. You have things like Keycloak. Uh, for the continuous delivery, you can have GitOps like Argo CD and Flux. So these are like the capabilities. Um, and then one quick way that you can get started is with uh, mention the IDP builder. Um, so the IDP builder is located in a in a different repo. I'll click on it, and this is the the link uh, under the Canoe organization IDP builder and uh, from here is a it's a CLI you can, that you can download. Um, and here's the last version was from March 12th, and you can download the binary. And then what you need to have in your computer is uh, Docker and a little bit of memory, like uh, around like six gigs of memory. If you don't have access to that, you can use a remote Linux machine. Um, in this case, we support something like CoSpaces, so you can go come to CoSpaces. And the machines um, are big enough that you can uh, deploy uh, there. Uh, so I can create a code space um, and that will deploy the system and I'll be able to log in. Um, I'll stop here because I have, I use a different tool uh, also for a remote, remote Linux machine is called uh, DevPod. Um, and DevPod allows you to have a, this um, standard of dev container. So we have a dev container file in here a JSON file that describes kind of this, the an environment. Obviously, it's a Linux environment. So I have a dev pod, and I uh, created an, a workspace pointing to this uh, repository. And when you click on it, um, you, it connects to it uh, with, via VS Code. So that's, uh, that's what I have here. So um, if you are not using the CLI, you can also build it. Um, so in this case, I have, uh, let me move this here, because these are the passwords that I need. So in this, um, you will do a make build. I'm going to run it, but you do make build. Uh, you run that, and then that will give you this uh, CLI utility IDP builder. And you can run IDP builder uh, that's that help and see the commands that are available, like create, completion, help. So we have one reference implementation in here that you can follow. It has a readme. So there's a folder called examples, reference implementation. Let me see if I can have, um, usually have a circle to point out or I'm um, pointing to. Let me see, you tell me if you see a red circle. Do you see a red circle? Yes, we do. Okay. So with this little utility, IDP Builder, you can run it by itself. So we have a few examples. So we have a basic example uh, with one package and another package. Each one has a, a readme that you can follow. Um, but the one that I'm going to show today is this third one, reference reference implementation. That is a folder that has the components that I want to bootstrap the Kubernetes cluster with one command. And then all these components will be installed with Argo CD. Um, so this is going to deploy Argo workflows, backstage, uh, backstage templates, core DNS, cross plane, external secrets, key cloak. All these things are basically Argo CD applications that it will bootstrap and it will come also with a Git server inside. So you don't need any external dependencies to be running, anything to be set up. The CLI would just run a Kubernetes cluster and the Git server will be inside. And we use something called Git T. So if you follow the readme, I'm going to show you a little bit how it looks like. Uh, it has three scenarios. Uh, so uh, the command, uh, you will need to have the IDP builder, kubectl, enough memory. So in this case, I'm connected to a Linux machine uh, with DevPod to in AWS. So it comes up and then when I close VS Code, it just shuts down 
after if I'm not using it. So you can run this command. I'm going to put it here into the command line. You can see here. Um, so I'm put, going to put the dot. I'm going to run the CLI create use path routing, meaning I'm going to be using uh, path based routing with nginx. So it comes with nginx also. Uh, and then the package directory example reference implementation. I can run it like this or run it with a flag called dash dash no exit. So it continuously watches the folder. So if I change any of the YAML files um, in here, like our workflows, and I change some of the YAML files, it automatically syncs to the Git server. Or just run it like this, and then uh, everything is set up. And if you change something, you can run the command again, and it would just like sync again. So this is a quick way that you can get started uh, running this one command. Uh, it comes up with all these components as a stack, as a full IDP. Um, and then uh, these are the UIs that will be running. So as you can see here, it's just finished because I just ran it before joining here uh, if this morning, uh, my morning. And basically, you open these uh, URLs. So you can click on it, and then this will be opening. You open here a different, a different UI. So it open here. This is Argo CD. And um, to get the password for Argo CD, basically you just run this command down here. We're going to run it. The password will be inside. And it's okay if I show it because the idea is this is a local development. Uh, this is running in my computer. And I did a port uh, forward of the port A443. So I'm basically running on local host. But if you have a big computer, you can run it locally uh, or in code spaces. There's a file called codespaces.md. So you follow the instructions here for codespaces. Um, you can download the CLI and then um, run one command to replace the domain names for codespaces and then run a similar command, create with extra parameters. So you're doing codespaces, follow the codespaces.md. Um, following this one because I'm running in, in EC2. Um, so going back to the instructions, um, I open, I can open Argo CD. I can open, let me move this a uh, little bit down here. So that's Argo CD. I can open Argo workflows. Uh, I can open Git T, which is the Git server. Let me open here. Uh, Git T. Oh, it's opening somewhere else. So here's Git T. Uh, the next one is uh, Backstage. It's opening in a different window. Move it here. So if you can uh, want to log into Argo CD, you can come in here and then sign in. And as you can see, this is Argo CD. Um, it's, deploy, it's deploy everything. It deploy core DNS, cross plane, backstage. All together. Sometimes this takes a lot of time and, and knowledge to put put it together. What we're trying to do here is give you a stack that out of the box, we're running one command, it comes up and it's running. So let's log in into uh, backstage and see some of the scenarios um, or, or Git T. Uh, let's see Git T. If you go to Git T, this is kind of like GitHub, uh, but it's a Git server running inside the Kubernetes cluster. When you go into production uh, or staging, you will have this repository in something like GitLab or, or GitHub, uh, whatever your organization use. But you as a platform developer are like um, uh, doing development. So in here, you can see all the YAML files that got synced from your local computer. So for example, if I go to uh, Keycloak, I will see the YAML files to deploy Keycloak. And you will see here like how Keycloak gets deployed. Um, so let's go to backstage and then to sign into backstage, it will ask me for the username and password. And if we follow the readme, you can get that information from the command line asking the uh, in the terminal. And we are putting a new features in the IDP builder to get like a command to give you the secrets directly. So in this case, I'm going to copy the user password for user one and user two. So I'm going to log in as user one. Again, this is an example for you to learn how to do single sign-on, how to configure a single sign-on with OIDC into Backstage. Um, so you start like um, from the beginning, like 
with a stack that works out of the box and then you start bidding on top of it. In this case, Backstage is empty and you can go into Create. And then there's, there's three examples templates and we have more examples on things like Jupyter Hub as a service, Cluster as a service. But this is kind of like one of the basic stacks that comes with three scenarios. So we're going to show um, if I'm a developer, maybe I want to uh, deploy a basic deployment. Um, so I'm going to choose this one and I'm going to give it a name, demo one, uh, click review and then create. And then this uh, backstage is using a, a template that you as a platform engineer created for your developers that basically is going to create a Git repository. It will copy the YAML files and the source code into that Git repository, register in Argo CD, um, and then register back into backstage. So if you open the catalog, you will see that the demo one, that this component is being deployed into the Kubernetes cluster, in this case, the cluster that you created with kind, and then it's registered with Argo CD. So these are plugins into backstage that we have. And then you can click on it and you will see the information that it was created in Argo CD and you can jump into Argo CD and see the app being deployed. You can also go into, uh, for example, uh, the Git repo. So I can copy here the Git repo, put it into Git T and then we can see the repo that got uh, created. Uh, let me go from here to go TT demo one. And then you will go directly into this demo one. So from this time, time point, the developer can start coming in here and changing their the deployment.yaml uh, and everything in here. In this case, I'm deploying NGINX, uh, for example. I can do another demo, uh, which uh, let me see if it's configured. You have to set up credentials. So I'll, I'll double check if, if credentials are not there, but it will show you what is created. Um, another example is let's say that uh, you want to create a Go application uh, with a with an AWS resource. In this case, I think it's an S3 bucket, like I show in the picture. And you can click in here and we can say demo two. And this, all these instructions are in that readme that I show. So you can like practice this. Somebody was asking, how do I practice this? So you can just run that CLI, exactly the steps that I'm doing here. And then in here is like um, the storage buckets, uh, object storage that I want to create. Um, I can select if I want to, when I delete the YAML file, delete the buckets, uh, the region that I want to create it, maybe is US West 2, um, and then defaults for uh, provider config and review, and then create. And then this again will have a different template that is going to be created in Git, the Git server and then register back into Argo CD. So if we open the catalog, the same concept in here, I can go back to home and I can see like I have deployed demo one and demo two. Uh, so let's go to demo two. And in here, you can see the relationship of this component depends on a resource called demo to bucket. So a demo to bucket was created and registered into backstage. So we'll go here back demo two and is sync. I'll open Argo CD and Argo CD basically deploy uh, the a, an example app. In this case, we're using NGINX as say like an example with three pods and a storage bucket using crossplane. So there's a YAML file sitting there saying, I want an S3 bucket to be used uh, for this application. So if we go back to Git T, we just see demo two. So here's demo two. Um, and here's the YAML files, the repo that the backstage created for the user that the user can start modifying in here, like the main.go code is empty as an example. So this is a starting point, but you can have your own templates. Um, you can have the customize and we can see the base here and then we can see demo2.yaml. And then here is the, the story object. So this is a an API that you created using, uh, for example, crossplane that you want a object storage bucket um, to be located in US, uh, uh, US West 2. And 
is gets when you remove this YAML file and remove it from the Kubernetes cluster, it gets it gets deleted. Uh, let me see if we can see this uh, object storage. Um, also, you can take a look in the command line interface, and you can do k gets um, buckets. Uh, kubectl gets buckets, I believe, and there's a bucket here that is being created from Kubernetes. So the bucket name, it looks like is this. If I log in into my, let's um, see if I can log in. One second. I can log in into my account and let's check if the S3 bucket is created. Uh, S3, US West 2, and then uh, what is it? It has demo 2 in it. So this bucket was created April 21st. So that's the bucket and the name matches, so PF62. So now this is a bucket that got created on behalf of the developer that wanted to get started with an application that maybe wants to save files into object storage. A very simple scenario where the developers now can just go into backstage uh, and start requesting the apps that they have to do. And basically they get access now to Git and start like modifying the application in Git. And then the application automatically gets deployed with Argo CD. So as a platform engineer, these are kind of the skills that you will have uh, to build an internal developer platform for your organization on using Kubernetes tools to develop, to create a user experience for your scientists that are doing machine learning or AI projects or um, developers that just want to get started with their workloads and you decided you want to give them a namespace or deploy the app in the cluster or give them a full cluster that depends on platform resources, infrastructure, meaning databases, S3 buckets, um, and such that the application needs. And this way, the applications from Kubernetes can access them. Um, the last one is a Spark job. So if you're familiar with Spark, you can also play with Spark. The Kubernetes cluster is deployed with the Spark operator, again, from Argo CD, um, and deploy the Spark job. So this is a Spark job where, um, I think this demo three, if you follow the instructions in the readme, it will guide you through the process of like exactly what I'm doing here. Click the create button, deploy a simple app, deploy demo two. Uh, this one is Kubernetes, uh, Git T and Argo CD, uh, the Spark operator, um, and then uh, it will deploy. So in this case, if I want to deploy demo three, uh, this is the Spark example from the Spark uh, project. Uh, it has the operator inside. And then this would use Argo workflows uh, to create the, the Spark job. So it also shows you how to do, how to use Argo workflow, which is installed. Everything else, everything is installed in Argo CD. If you go here, uh, you will see that uh, we have the Spark operator uh, installed, key cloak, everything is defined declarative in, in Git from this folder. So if you change something in the folder, automatically gets synced into the cluster when you create run the IDP builder again. Um, so I'll stop. Uh, I'll stop here um, and answer any questions. Let me go back to the chat if there's any questions. So there is only one question. So Alan was asking, can we use Minio instead of S3 buckets? So in this in in this stack um, that we have here, we are using uh, cross-plane providers. Um, so if there's a Minio, um, I'm not sure if there's a uh, Minio. Uh, cross-plane um, provider that you can configure uh, with YAML files, um, it should be able to do it. Uh, but I'm not sure cross-plane has a menu provider. So that's that's a good question. 
Okay. Uh, okay. I believe uh, it's been answered. It says yeah, thanks on Kaola, the Kaola, uh, Kaoka said that, yeah, you can search for uh, cross point provider. Upbound has a marketplace. Uh, upbound marketplace. Upbound is the company that uh, supports cross plane. Um, and they have a bunch of community and also vendor base uh, uh, providers. So it's a matter of finding a provider that implements, a provider is kind of the Kubernetes controller that implements the API for many things uh, like a GitHub, um, even as, uh, Argo. And there's many, many providers that you can find in here and you can search. Uh, let me see if I can, there's menu here. There's no, there's no menu uh, provider, but there's other providers that you can use. Okay, I think there is no other question. No other question? Uh, no, no, no question. Ah, it looks like somebody found the pro provider for Minio. So yeah, it looks like you can use you can use Minio and also deploy the uh, Minio through Argo CD, right? And then install this provider um, to configure to configure Minio. So. The idea is to any any tool that runs in Kubernetes, you'll be able to use and then expose. Uh, we're giving you a framework uh, where you can use uh, these uh, these tools and also help you with some getting started. For example, with uh, backstage and backstage templates, we have a few templates here um, that you can see here. These are backstage templates, and we also have a CLI utility called Canoe CLI that would take, for example, a Kubernetes um, API that you have. In this case, this was created with the Canoe CLI where you, you tell it a CRD or Kubernetes API spec, and it will create you this portion of the template for you to use in Backstage. We also have the same thing for Terraform. So if you have a Terraform and the TF, TF variables, it will read the variables and then create you help you create this template in Backstage that then you can uh, expose it and then run Terraform from Backstage, for example, to build, to deploy something with Terraform. So the idea is provide an interface, a user experience that the organization can go into Backstage and then see uh, the, it can access everything from there. So it looks like my machine uh, shut down um, and it's not accessible anymore, but yeah. Um, that's that's the experience that we we want to uh, give uh, users when they do this. So let me uh, go. Uh, am I sharing my the, the slides? So uh, just to summarize, kind of the best practices I guidance and when you're building an IDP is build with your customers. Like if you're having meetings to create an internal developer platform. Make sure that the consumers, uh, you're building a product internally. Make sure your customers, the consumers of your platform are involved from the beginning. So you are building the right thing that they would adopt. If they don't adopt it, then you have a platform that nobody uses. The other one is documentation and education, uh, which is, I said, uh, the adoption comes from having good documentation that the developers that are using uh, your backstage UI, or maybe you're not using backstage. Your your API is create Git repos with YAML files, uh, and then Argo CD takes care from that point on. Make sure that you have the right set of documentation that they can find it um, and work with it. Um, and education, meaning like having office hours, like just maybe once a week office hours where people come in, uh, either ask questions or you give demos of the last features that you implemented so you can build a community of your IDP. Um, and the, the next one is don't build the ocean. Like don't, never create a new platform. If you're already doing uh, some aspects of this, try to extend it or take one use case and then try to build it to see what are the things you learn and to learn the tools. So don't try to like completely change the way you work or the organization work, just do one use case 
that has some business value and implement it end to end. And you will see that there'll be many benefits from there, from you learning how to build an IDP for one use case to the point of other others in your company learning about use cases that they can also uh, extend. And then provide an escape hash. Like I said, if you are providing an abstraction to your developers or consumers or scientists, always offer them like, if you don't, if you cannot use the abstraction for any reason, an escape hatch that they can go directly, maybe use Gypsy tail and access something or create something that is just is not provided yet by the platform team, but eventually it will be available. So always have them uh, have an escape hatch that they is not all or nothing. They can also work around to get their workloads deployed and continue for the business value. Um, not all um, workloads. Um, are the same size. So you have different type of workloads. You may have serverless workloads uh, implemented through this API, uh, Kubernetes workloads, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence workloads implemented with the, your API. So make sure that um, you address uh, all of them individually. Again, having your cons customer or consumers uh, as uh, first in hand on giving you guidance and feedback. Um, and I think that's it. Um, uh, you're welcome to give me some feedback um, on this presentation. Also, you can follow me in the different uh, social media platforms. Um, and happy to collaborate. And if you're interested in the, the Canoe project, you're welcome to join the CNCF Slack. Uh, it's called Canoe-Interest. And also give, give IDP a, a try. So you can start learning about platform engineering and building an IDP on top of Kubernetes APIs. Do you have more questions? Okay, thank you. There is uh, one question here. Can I use Tecton instead of Argo? Yep, you can use Tecton instead of Argo workflows. Um, that's one of the uh, technologies that it can that it can, it can can implement the CI. Um, yep. So the idea is like any technology that you can use in Kubernetes now becomes available for your IDP. That's that's the uh, kind of like broad, broad answer to that question is if X technology works in Kubernetes and is Kubernetes native, then you benefit from having another tool that you can use to build your IDP. Okay, so I don't think uh, there is any other question on the chat. So maybe you can give us your uh, parting shots. Your what? Parting shots. <laughs> your last words. Do you have any last words? Oh, yeah. So like, like I said, um, if you're looking into this space, um, either you're maybe in, in college or you are uh, learning on your own. Um, yeah, Kubernetes is a, is a uh, great tool to, to learn, to get prepared for the job market. And then this additional uh, on top of it is doing uh, being DevOps, right? The learning the cloud technologies, learning about the Kubernetes technologies and then how they come together to build a, a platform. And many com companies are trying to build internal developer platforms. So if you're in the job market or trying to be a cloud engineer, DevOps engineer, these are kind of the skills that can help you uh, get a job in, in those markets. So I know a lot of people join this community and also LinkedIn uh, trying to learn about this technology and prepare themselves for uh, interviews or trying to get a job. So uh, hopefully this type of presentation is helpful for you and also the, the open source projects that we're doing with our, our customers that are doing it in the open. Okay, thank you so much. So since there are no other questions, uh, at this point, I, I'd really like to thank you for taking your time to prepare for us this presentation. And I believe it has been impactful to the people who have attended. We'll be sharing the recording on our channel as well so that other community members may have access to it as well. So.
Thank you so much for uh, the presentation. And uh, that will be the end of it. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording uh, by tomorrow uh, in our group channel. So you, uh, you guys will be able to access the recording from there. And you can revisit anything that uh, you want to revisit. So that is it. Have a good week ahead of you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining today. Appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.